Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Welcome to The Reason We Learn. I'm Deb Fellman, your host for this show today. If this is your first time at the channel, welcome. I hope you'll consider subscribing. I hope you'll consider at least liking this program and sharing it out with other parents who might benefit from what we're going to talk about. Um, today, we have a lot to cover. It's Monday, January 3rd, first day back for a new semester for most of our students. Um, if you are a public school parent, you're my target audience for this program. I am not full disclosure. I have my kids involved enrolled in an online homeschool program. So I want to share that with you because you might think I'm a hypocrite. If I'm about to tell you that virtual learning is virtually useless. And yet my daughter is on the other side of that door as we speak in a class online. But one of the things we're going to talk about today is how online learning is not virtual learning, they're not the same, and virtual learning is not homeschooling. There are fundamental differences, and we're going to talk about it. For the record, she's also in eighth grade, so that makes a difference. So the biggest chunk of the target of this program is people who have children K through five, but it does apply to children older than that because, remember, I have hand-selected the program for my daughter, knowing what I know about her, how she learns, what I would like her to learn, how I would like her to learn, and how much of it is online relative to offline. So big differences. So here's gonna here's how the show is going to go. We're going to uh, talk about what virtual is and isn't. I've already done a little bit, but I'm going to go into a little more. We're going to talk about how surprising it is that we are at this juncture, January 2022, even discussing, never mind already doing, the shift back to virtual, given what institutions like the CDC and major news outlets have said and reported about virtual learning and its impact on students. Then we're going to talk about specifically why it's a problem. Like, what are the specifics? Why is virtual learning bad for your kids? The way it's being done in particular, but in general, what the things are to look out for, the specific problems, and what could you do? What is a solution? If you're solution-oriented and you don't just want to come and hear me complain because I'm really not here to complain. I'm here to educate you about what is happening and what is not happening and try to give you some solutions towards the end of the program about what you can do instead. And if you're concerned, I'm going to say, just leave and homeschool, which of course, you know, that is my bent. I do think that it is superior for you to be independently in charge of your child's education. However, in the near term, there are some things you might be able to do to make the situation better for your specific child while you figure things out for the future. So, all right. Welcome again. I'll ask you one more time. Please consider slamming that like button so we get more eyeballs on this content. Share the link out with other parents you know who might be interested in it. And I hope you will consider subscribing to the channel if you're not already subscribed. All right. So let's get going. What is virtual learning? And what isn't it? Virtual, as it's being described by the public schools right now, is your child synchronously, that means at the same time, in real time, attending public school through Zoom or some other kind of online classroom, facing the teacher with the other kids in the class. And it's like they're in school, but they're not in school. They're just sitting in front of the computer with their teacher talking to them or showing them slides or showing them a little video clip or something. But basically, it's theoretically their classroom presented in Zoom. Okay, that is what most districts that do virtual do. Okay, it is also the literal definition of virtual school because what they're saying is we have a school and it's a building and it has classrooms and it has teachers and it has classmates but we're just putting it into this virtual environment. You're not really there. You're virtually there. Okay. What that is not is that not is not synonymous with online learning. That is not even necessarily synonymous with virtual education. There are different terms and it can get kind of confusing. So virtual school is literal. Your school in a virtual environment. Now, most of the time it's synchronous. It can still be virtual school if it's asynchronous. What do I mean by that? Well, the teacher says, I've created some little videos of lectures or classes your student can attend 
anytime, you know, can log on and watch this little video and complete these assignments using these other apps or other things or write on a piece of paper or whatever they're going to do. And then email it to me, submit it to Google Classroom, whatever. They're going to do that on their own and they're going to submit the assignment on their own and then I'll grade it by such and such a date. And you're not even going to really see me. I've done this virtually. You have more flexibility, but it's still school going on in this virtual environment. Some schools have done that as well. They've allowed their teachers to do that. Some school districts, especially charters within school districts, are allowing teachers to decide. So you might have one teacher that says, I'm going to make little videos and have my kids do everything in Google Classroom or Canvas or Schoolology, if you have PowerSchool. And other teachers are saying, no, I'm going to have synchronous classes where I'm facing the kids and we're having a conversation or I'm presenting material that way. And they're allowing their teachers to make a plan. It will probably vary depending on your school district. And because I can't know what every district is doing, I can just present you with different things. If the school is taking what they ordinarily do and you would otherwise do live if you showed up today and just sticking online, that's virtual school, okay? Online learning is different in that it is explicitly develop the curriculum, the lesson plans, even the teachers are hired for their expertise in this area around presenting in this environment. Typically, those kinds of online learning experiences take into account the deficits of learning in an online platform. Okay, They, they acknowledge it or they have a workaround based on lots of research and development and time and technology expertise and all kinds of things. So online learning is not necessarily the same as a virtual school, okay? Many homeschoolers, myself included, use online learning platforms. They can range from an app, okay, that you play games with and there is no teacher, it to uh, something like a Khan Academy where you self-select when and how and what subjects and so forth a little lecture to watch in a video and then some quizzes to take. And then maybe you have some offline interaction with your parent or a teacher or a tutor to back that up. It's some kind of combination. What we in the homeschooling community refer to this as is blended learning. That means I'm doing some offline, I'm doing some online, but it's handpicked around the kid. The parent has decided my kid learns math really well using IXL or using some online platform. And then I'm just going to follow up with some worksheets and take a look over the shoulder and help them and tutor them, or I have a tutor for them or whatever. That's blended learning. And online learning is what they're doing when this online program or uh, the online teacher. So it is not the same as a virtual school where you don't decide any of it. It's presented to you as is. Okay. Um, so it's not homeschooling. A lot of people say, oh, we're homeschooling this week because of virtual learning. No, that's not true because technically homeschooling, again, you would decide. You would choose what your child's going to learn, when they're going to learn, the scope and sequence, how fast they progress, if they have classmates, if they don't, it, all of it you're going to choose. When it's just, here it is, plain vanilla, this is what you get. These are the deadlines. This is the progression. This is how it works. If you have a problem, you're going to have to find somebody or figure it out, that's virtual school. Okay. Um, so what's wrong about, what's wrong with this? What is the problem with virtual school? Um, well, you know what? I'm going to get to that after I tell you how surprising it is that they're doing it. And so to do that, I'm going to have to share some, I'm going to share my screen. I'm going to show you some things. First, I'm going to show you in my Twitter feed, what is being discussed right now in terms of narratives about returning to virtual school. It might surprise you. Um, and I, it surprised me a little bit. Okay. Because first I went looking for headlines to see, you know, what has been said. Cause I remembered back in March, even the CDC was saying learning loss, problems, mental health, et cetera, uh, with virtual learning. In fact, it was used as a justification not that long ago to get more money for things like SEL. Oh my gosh, their social emotional learning is behind their mental health is suffering because of all that time sitting in front of a computer. Right. So we've been Hearing it as a justification, virtual learning was a problem, was bad. We were forced to do it by circumstances, not our fault. And now we need a bunch of money and we need a bunch of indulgence and understanding to make up for this. And parents need to understand. And now I go to Twitter and I find out that they have to make arguments to bring it back and are claiming that our opposition, our 
parental opposition to it and even some educator opposition to it is the function of, are you ready? Capitalism. It's capitalism's fault that we are dissing virtual learning. Let me, let me show you because this, this blew my mind really. Um, all right, let's find the Twitter feed. Let's see if I can find this. All right. Virtual learning. Yeah, this was pretty, pretty mind blowing actually. All right. So here's my Twitter feed. I don't know how well you can see it, but, um, this person was responding. I did a search on virtual learning and this person was responding to somebody saying, LMAO at White House press correspondent demanding Biden destroy teachers unions because the person was saying this is a Reagan versus air traffic controller moment in 1981. Yes, the comparison is limited and inexact, but I do think if Biden doesn't stand up to the teachers unions or school on school closures, he loses credibility at a critical time in his presidency. And here's where it comes in. Feels like all the people crying kids can't learn via Zoom are the same people who promoted e-learning and MOOCs, et cetera, pre-pandemic. Curious. Perhaps because the money they could make off private e-learning and MOOCs is threatened by public schools gaining expertise in virtual learning. Or it's just the parents not available for work thing. Basically, capitalism. How do you feel, parents? How does that make you feel? Yes, it's capitalism to blame, apparently. Now, this is why it's important for you to understand as parents that e-learning, online learning, the kinds of tools that many independent, you know, homeschool educators and even some parents use for supplemental, why they are different than virtual learning. And perhaps they're threatened by public schools gaining expertise. No, no, honey. I'm, I mean, I personally, if I ran one of these companies, would not be the smallest bit concerned about public schools gaining expertise in something where they aren't even experts at the content. So in other words, even when the kids are in the building in front of the teachers and the teachers are supposedly teaching them how to read and do math, the scores, the results are dismal. We've seen it. The nation's report card is put out by the government itself. We've got a serious illiteracy and innumeracy problem, and let's not even discuss science and civics, which are both below 25% proficiency by 12th grade. That is absolutely outrageous. You should go check it out. Google, you can even Google it. And even Google's showing you the nation's report card, and you can verify everything I've just said. Um, so I'm not concerned they're going to gain expertise at virtual learning when they don't have expertise at in-person learning. They cannot seem to do the teaching properly. There is a mass exodus right now of excellent teachers. They are retiring. They're resigning. They're leaving. And not just teachers. Parents are even. Lots of people are leaving their jobs because they're tired of this up and down. They're tired of mandates. They're tired of a lot of things. And they're, they've figured out over the last two years how to make it maybe on one income. And a lot of people are simply leaving the workforce. So the parents not available work thing is still a problem for many, many families, probably most. But it's a declining problem. In other words, people are starting to realize I may have to be around to make sure my kid gets an education because they keep changing and moving the goalposts on me. So I don't think this has anything to do with why people are complaining. They know even when their kids went back to school from September to now, there wasn't a lot of learning going on. And they also know that before the lockdowns, there wasn't a lot going on. So if they're not experts at presenting the learning in the classroom, I don't really think we're in danger of seeing you become experts at the virtual learning. And since there is not a standard way that is proven excellent and so forth that the districts can snap up and run with and train their teachers on, it's, it just doesn't work that way um, because they're restricted by so many things. They're restricted by who they've hired to be teachers and what their expertise is. They can't fire them. They're in unions. They're restricted by what they have to teach because the Board of Education tells them what they have to cover and what amount of time. What you can cover in a building and what you can cover online in a span of time is very different. They're restricted by the amount of social emotional learning they need to do, which doesn't really lend itself very well to the online environment. There's so many things that they have put in their own way that don't put capitalism at any risk. They really don't. If people are going to make money online learning, they're going to make money. This is not at risk. So that I found to be fascinating and look for that to be a new narrative. Now, what else is going on? Um, I went up and looked at latest for virtual learning. And here we have this. 
Is there a reason the schools are in session today when you could do virtual learning? The snow is sticking. And when I was a young kid, when I was a young, a kid died driving to school and weather like this. You know what? Kids die in cars. It's tragic. But they die when it's raining. They die when it's dry. They die. I mean, people die in cars. Are we now moving towards the what what people have been joking about for two years of like, well, if we've got to protect people from every risk, no one should drive. This is a narrative that's going to gain steam because, as you probably have noticed, the teachers and public schools the unions, they don't want to teach in person. Now, you might wonder, Deb, why is that? Well, let's look at some of the potential reasons. I don't know. I can't tell you exactly why. I can hypothesize. And one hypothesis is managing the classroom is increasingly difficult for teachers. They're asked to do a lot without having a lot of authority to discipline in the classroom. So cover all this material, teacher, and do it in an equitable way and make sure you're not showing any bias and make sure your privilege is checked and make sure all of these things are going on and do all the social emotional learning. Be a therapist, even though you're not trained to be a therapist. So many things they're burdening the teachers with, but you can't discipline anybody because that would be unfair and that would be inequitable and that might be racist and so forth and so on. So a lot of these kids whose last actual in-person experience in classroom was two years ago, came back to school absolutely incapable of managing their emotions and their time and their physical body movements. They've been cooped up in a house. Discipline problems were off the chart, off the chart. So you might think, gosh, I'd rather be behind a camera and not have to deal with it and have that be the parent's problem. That might be one reason. Another reason is you simply don't have to work as many hours. You're at home in your pajamas. Maybe you even have a work mullet on. You know, it's like work from the waist up and my pajama pants from the waist down. Maybe you just want to do the asynchronous thing, record a couple of videos and spend the rest of your day tutoring for varsity tutors and making more money or sleeping or reading a book or writing a book or any number of other things you might want to do um, other than your job while still getting paid to do your job. Okay. So this is going to be a narrative you start seeing. Why are we going to school? Dangers, safety risks. All right. And ex instead of extending the winter break, our fearless leadership team is going to turn back to their favorite ineffective form of learning. You'll also see this, some support for parents and teachers. Virtual learning, simply mind boggling that any anyone still supports this government, et cetera, okay? Then we have here, thoughts and prayers for the teachers who should have had a snow day, but instead are gearing up for virtual learning. So now they don't even want to do the virtual learning. Like it's snowing, all you have to do is stay home. But it, like they don't even want to do virtual learning. Um, then there's colleges that are doing it. And then this one, Salem mayor, Kim Driscoll in virtual learning says it doesn't work well for our students and families. So politicians are trying to stick up for in classroom learning. Some of them then here, I want teachers protected and mitigation efforts taken if existing protocols fail, but I'm not on board with virtual learning. So it's going back and forth and back and forth. And what you will find is the unions want the virtual learning, the unions, I'm not going to impugn the motivations of all teachers. Some teachers definitely do want it. Yeah, a lot of them, the ones that support their unions. But the ones that don't, they're not happy about this. But here you have it. The CTU may refuse to do in-person learning. They may straight up refuse. That's a huge union with a lot of members. So I'm not going to belabor this anymore, but you see that this is a hot topic right now and the schools are doing it. As far as who is doing it, I think um, Milwaukee said they were going to do it. Um, so let's see who else I'm scrolling through. There were some schools that already announced that they were doing it. Um, and some that won't Baltimore city schools are not doing it. Um, some are having snow days, but that's for lo that's local as far as snow, but there are districts, large districts around the country that are wanting to do virtual or already doing it. Maybe some of you have, Maybe some of you are already shoved back into virtual learning. So let's leave this. And now I'm going to talk to you about why this is all so surprising from the official sources. Like, in other words, why do we have to go to Twitter and see back and forth at all? Why isn't the CDC stepping up to back up the things they said themselves about virtual learning? For example, let's take a look at this. Um, okay. Parents with kids in virtual school are more stressed. Some use drugs and alcohol to cope, CDC study says. Now, granted, it's a, hot, it's a headline and I'm skeptical of studies. That said, common sense would tell you this is probably pretty close to true. This is March 2021. 
Parents and their children enrolled in virtual school during COVID pandemic are more likely to report signs of negative physical, mental, and emotional health. Children receiving virtual instruction and their parents might need additional resources to cope. Okay, so that's just one example. Let's go to another one. Let's see, that was that one. This one is about, I wish I could just go toggle from screen to screen, but it doesn't really let me do that. Sorry, guys. All right, virtual school resulting in significant academic learning loss study finds. Also March 2021, this is just this past spring, more than half of public school K-12 teachers said the pandemic resulted in a significant learning loss for students, both academically and their social emotional progress. Other research also showed distance learning has caused a significant setback in achievement, particularly among Black and Hispanic students and students with disabilities. We're going to discuss that in a moment because that is relevant to the specific reasons it's a problem. And let's see one more I'm going to do. Um, let's see. I had that one. I think those were the main ones as far as why it's a problem, but there it's the CDC was saying it was just terrible. And hold on one quick second. Let's see if I've got these links. No, I guess not. Um, all right. So now what we're going to do is we're going to talk about why specifically it is a problem. What is going on with virtual school? Why, why you don't want to be doing it? So I hope I've given you this, you know, like the, even the CDC has said this is a problem. Teachers have said it's a problem. You just saw some of the links in Twitter. It's a problem. And you probably know instinctively in your gut, like it, my kid's miserable. I'm miserable. This isn't happening. They're not learning. They're behind. They're sad. They're lonely. They're bored. They're cheating. Like they're literally sitting there with the screen open and then they've got their little phone in front of it playing a game. I mean, there's so many workarounds that it looks like you're in attendance, but you're not really in attendance. You know, you spend five minutes on TikTok and you'll learn all the methods that the kids are using to do that. All right. So now we go to this one. All right. So five reasons virtual learning is terrible and how we can change it. There are better ways to teach children in schools and education. So they could they could be doing better. And with the $180 billion minimum they got for COVID relief, they should have been doing better. But no, they're not. Um, because like I said, they're, you can't take teachers who are educated a certain way to do things a certain way and then like overnight make them experts in doing something when they're already demonstrating lack of expertise in the subject matter. So, I, you know, you have to really know your subject matter to be able to adapt the instruction of your subject matter. And what you guys may not be aware of as parents, teachers know this, mo most of them, um, the ones who've been doing it for a long, long time know this, is that the current teacher education programs that are out there spend precious little time on instructional design, if at all, if at all, okay? So you might get more of it in a master's program, but in those, you know, sort of basic education programs, they don't spend a lot of time on here's how you design a lesson. Never mind. Here's how you design a lesson to be d delivered in multimedia, in a digital format, in a virtual format. Here's how to adapt it. They're probably adding classes as we speak for this process. But most people out there teaching now haven't done that. They'd have to go back and get re-education. What have most of our teachers been spending their time getting re-educated on in the last year and a half? Was it this? They probably had a couple classes. Zoom, how to use it, things like that. But lots of DEI, right? Lots of SEL. Lots of here's how to implement the gender curriculum so that you're towing the line with the law and you're not going to get in trouble. Um, here's how to make sure you implement the ethnic studies curriculum or the African-American studies curriculum that we've just mandated from the top down. So they've been coping with a bunch of new mandates related to equity, diversity, inclusion, SEL, et cetera, in, in anti-racism and equity work and all this in the last two years on top of trying to stay up to date on teaching their subject matter, which by the way, is mostly aiming towards how to teach it in an equity through an equity lens, not how to make sure they learn math, right? Math skills. And now on top of that, please go learn how to deliver it effectively in a virtual platform and be able to change on a dime from like today you're doing it in the classroom, tomorrow you're doing it not in the classroom today. You're I mean, makes your head hurt, doesn't it? It's really easy to sit and dog on teachers because we see the TikTok teachers and we're like, oh my God. But the vast majority of teachers are just out there going, um, uh, what? Okay. If any of us had to do that, we'd probably be going, I don't want to do this. <laughs> like this is too much, right? They're asking a lot. And then if your union is coming down and saying from the top, this is what we're going to do because it's largely political. What do you do then? You might be stuck not being able to go to work 
because your union is staging a huge walkout and now you're at odds with all of your colleagues. This is not a fun place to be, guys. So that's one of the reasons a lot of people are leaving. A lot of people are leaving. Okay, so let's take a look at some of these reasons. Now, these are not going to surprise you. Sitting in front of a computer the other day is nonsense or the, the entire day. We don't even want, I mean, do we really need to go into this in depth? Even those of us who work in front of computers, like I do, like many of you probably do, we get up, we walk around, we come back. It's up to us, right? It's up to us to a large degree. We might work with the computer. We might work on a computer. We might even work in front of a computer for large segments of the day. But if we need to go to the bathroom at any given time, unless we're literally in a meeting, and even then we can mute ourselves and black out our screens and get up and go and come back and we're adults, we can check in and say, what did I miss? I mean, it's a completely different thing when you are a little kid trying to learn a new skill. And, you know, pay, for most of us, paying attention to something for more than about 20 minutes is very challenging very challenging. And doing it online is even more difficult. Now, if you get bored or you're tired or the blue light is bothering you or so forth, the likelihood you're going to look around your room or maybe put something in front of the screen and multitask or play a game is much higher. You don't have to be a bad kid to want to do that. I know kids are sitting reading books. I mean, to their credit, they're sitting there with their like favorite manga or whatever. And they're just like reading a book or a graphic novel while the class is going on. Okay. So that's difficult. Then you've got just technical issues, okay? Video conferences can be glitchy. Zoom can be glitchy. Um, depending where the teacher is and what their Wi-Fi is or their ability to get online or the student, you know, that's not going to always work. Living arrangements. This seems common sense, right? Does everyone have like a dedicated space to have a quiet ability? Does everyone have, you know, headsets, ear, you know, air earbuds, blah, 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 to sit there. And even if you do, can you tune out the bar, the dog barking, people coming in and out, your siblings sitting next to you trying to learn? Even homeschool families have to work this out, by the way. Even we have to think before we plan our homeschooling. The difference is we can spend our time during the summer or whenever thinking how to optimize the space we've got. How much are we going to do here at the library, in, out, whatever. I mean, it's up to us. Virtual learning is like, nope, you got to be in a certain place at a certain time. And if your home is the only place with the Wi-Fi strong enough, or if Starbucks is the only place with the Wi-Fi strong enough because you don't have it at home, then that's where you've got to go. I've gone into coffee shops and seen kids sitting there trying to do virtual school for hours at a time. That is just not conducive to learning anything except how adults don't understand you. That's what they're learning. Adults don't get me. Okay. So then we've got the lack of resources for practical classes. How are we learning science? If you're in a middle school science class, wherever it's, this is part of why, by the way, they're moving away from lab science into all kinds of STEM and you know, they do a lot of reading and exercises. They watch little video labs and it's, it's not awful, but it's not the same as being somewhere. Even, like I said, even homeschool parents have to solve this problem with some kind of blended learning. Um, so it's very difficult. You might need to use your kitchen to do a lab and maybe mom or dad don't want you to do that. And maybe they want to talk to the teacher about what's involved in the materials they have to buy, which by the way, they now have to buy because they're not sending you home with a little, you know, sending home a little bag with all your little materials for, you know, bio or chemistry or the let's make a battery experiment. So you're supposed to go out and buy that now. And then of course, I would argue Many of us would argue that the teaching style, even in the classroom, is already outdated or it's, it's got too much of one or the other. It's either too much of the I'm standing in front of the room or I'm just lecturing at you and talking to you. And now I tell you, go go do work on your own. Or it's too much of the go do work on your own and I'll be sitting here at my desk. And if you have questions, come get me when the ideal setup is tailored to the specific subject matter, the specific kids. And, you know, sometimes I'm, I'm presenting, sometimes I'm walking around the room, you know, it's, it's adapted to the given day, to the subject, to the kids, to their abilities and all of that. You have to come up with a way to do it consistently in this environment because you don't have those, you don't have that flexibility. So you end up deferring most of the time to the outdated mode of present, present, present. Okay. Go do work and submit it on Google classroom. So if, unless your child is one who can sit and p pay attention to present, 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 unless they're a proficient reader and can read slides, if it's presented in text, 
you know, unless they're, you know, not easily distracted and they can sit and watch a video and then apply it to what they need to learn on paper. I mean, this is assuming a lot of things about these learners and there's no ability to respond. There's no ability to respond. So that's that one. And then I wanted to go to a, another that gives some more examples of why it's a problem. Um, with, uh, with the virtual learning, let me get that one up here. Okay. All right. Now this comes to us from a homeschooling mom and she has written this, I believe both for the, um, both for the, the public school audience to kind of sell them on homeschooling. So full disclosure, she's a homeschool mom and would like you to homeschool as would I. Um, but she's also speaking to homeschoolers to make sure they understand the limitations of any kind of virtual classroom environment so they can adapt it to their child or select blended learning opportunities for their child. So it's not a one size fits all solution, even if you're doing it. Okay. So the first one seems obvious again, you know, the relationships are difficult to maintain with the instructor. That doesn't mean they're impossible. My kids have great relationships with their, they're called mentors with their mentors, but it's more difficult and it's especially difficult for students K through five. So we're talking about the littler kids, very difficult. These are children, younger children rely much more on closer one-to-one -one interpersonal feedback, which is also why this is very problematic. Okay. With the masks, um, to be able to learn the material, they need it's a higher touch environment. Typically, you may have one of those kids who's like, I'm just super self-motivated, self-directed. I read proficiently. I can go online and learn and I'm good, mom, bye. Okay, those kids do exist, but they're probably not the majority, right? Once you get to sixth grade and up, then maintaining relationships through an online environment gets a little bit easier, but it you want to work up to that. It, again, it requires that the K through five stuff was solid, like they're reading, they're writing, they're doing math at grade level. Now they can go in and they know how to take initiative. They know how to ask questions. They know how to, you know, read the instructions and figure it out. Very, very different. Okay. So then, you know, some places, I don't think they're doing this now. They're busing the kids. Um, they're busing the kids to the school to do virtual learning in the building to provide the childcare. That's just extra shades of crazy. You know, some people say, well, that's better because a mom and dad can go to work, but what are we teaching the kid about the adults? So it's too scary for the adults to come here, but I can be here in the building, but my teacher can't be here, but I have to send on a computer. The mixed messages just are sending, they're teaching the kid an extra lesson about adult humanity that you probably don't want them to learn. Um, Motivation needs monitoring. So in other words, successful online education, as she said, needs structured parental oversight in the home or daily interaction with the teacher. So this is something that we who use blended learning in the homeschool community understand, appreciate, and plan for. And those who are experts at delivering online education also do. So they're checking in. They're really available. They're super accessible to the to the child, to the parents, um, the parents themselves. If they you know, know right up front how much they're going to have to pay attention, where's the syllabus, what are the readings, how many hours should I expect to be spending with my child as a sort of adjunct instructor, helping them through these asynchronous assignments. So, and to find out how the kid is feeling about it. You've got to be on top of that every day and you need to be able to make adjustments. And that's something that they cannot do in the, in the sort of government uh, structured agenda. And that's why she's saying the learner teaches himself, but is constrained by the government agenda. So this learner, the kid is ending up doing most of the instruction for him or herself, or you, the mom or dad are trying to figure out how to do it, but you can't color outside the lines. What I can do is if I find out my daughter is struggling with some of the material that's being presented in her online academy, I not only can touch base with the teacher immediately and say, okay, this isn't working so well. Do you have any other options for me to remediate right now? Within 24 hours, sometimes the same day, I'll get a response. I can also just supplement with other stuff. And in many cases, I can write the teacher and say, this way of doing the lesson didn't work. So she did this instead to demonstrate her understanding of the material. And the teacher's like, that's fine. Okay. They just want to know the kid understands the concept, even if they presented the assignment a little bit differently. There's not a box they have to check for the government necessarily that says they filled out this exact form. Okay. 
So that's a constraint that you can't, you can't do anything about. Um, and then, or the parent is teaching the child, but constrained by that same agenda. So you want to help, but you have to use their method of math. Oh, and you must show the work the way they want. And you don't even understand how it works. You, you, you kind of have to do that. Um, then of course, what we talked about before, the online learning only tickles two senses, right? You know, your sight and your hearing and so forth, which in and of itself isn't a problem if the material has been adapted for those senses. All right. But if you have a learner, especially K through five, who needs to handle manipulatives or needs to move things around or needs to hold, needs practice on their handwriting, holding a pencil, which by the way, helps you learn writing differently than typing. These are completely different skills. Um, they're not going to learn it. They're just not going to learn it. Um, spelling, grammar, if, as long as they're spell check and grammarly, they may never learn these things because they're not using the pencil paper. So it's not very conducive to that. Children need to move. They just need to move. This is not, you know, rocket science here. And they'll tell you like, well, it's just a week or it's just a month or it's just a year. No, kids need to move every day, every single day. And again, so if it's synchronous and they have to sit there to be, you know, present or in attendance, this can be a problem. All right. Um, we talked about the handwriting as a problem. And then, of course, virtual schools require technology support. I tutored a kid last year who was struggling in virtual school in Texas because his technology was old. They didn't couldn't afford to go out and get a new laptop. Um, then they went into the school and got a Google. Uh, they got a, um, um, a Chromebook, but the Chromebook kept breaking and the technical support was not reachable. And he was missing class after class after class. And because the agenda was with the school, they couldn't wait for him. So they just kept on going. And before he knew it, he was behind a week in a class and there was an exam coming up and they couldn't change the date and so on and so on and so forth. So it this is this is a problem. And then of course, technology creates errors. I can't tell you how many students I've tutored that have come to me for tutoring because they kept getting answers wrong. And I looked and I'm like, your answer is correct, but your answer is correct. The system was programmed incorrectly and was marking them wrong. The parents didn't even know because why would you? You're trusting it's working, right? No, not necessarily. So if your student comes to you and says, I swear, mom, I did it and I know it's right. I've, I've checked it 17 times and they keep saying I'm wrong and I don't know what to do because for um, it's due. And if I don't turn it in by such and such PM and I hit the exit ticket button and thing and it's going to go in as a wrong answer and this isn't true. Listen to them. They're probably right. Um... Then we have, you know, you're shut out of your child's education. Um, we've already been through this on this channel. Like you don't have a say in what's going on. Um, and then, of course, it shifts the cost from the school to the learner, literally the financial costs where you are looking at, I now need to get this kind of high speed Internet. I need to have a laptop. I need to do this. I need to do that, which before I thought was taken care of by the school. And you're not reimbursed. They're not reimbursing you. But you know who is getting reimbursed? The school. As I've talked about in this channel many times, $180 billion for COVID relief. Okay. Now, a lot of that wasn't spent in the first year at all. They were sitting on it and then complaining, we're so underfunded, we're so underfunded. Then the next thing that was happening was they were um, they were sending seg a whole bunch of it, most of it, actually, most of the ARPA funds were going to SEL specifically. And the justification was these kids have been isolated for over a year and they have social emotional deficit. Now you're probably thinking, okay, Deb, you probably should look at, you know, tell us a little bit more about social emotional learning because you're always saying how much of a problem it is. Social emotional learning is just a thing. It's like we, we, we learn how to interact with people. We learn how to make eye contact. We learn how to get along well with others, manage our emotions, plan our time, interact in an environment with other humans. Okay. That's the social and emotional component of learning. And it is important. What SEL at this point is code for is a type of approach to teaching that gets inside the kids' heads and first tries to psychologize, like, you know, how are you feeling? And like, get inside their heads and do some work on their psychology before approaching the material or while approaching the material, as opposed to just addressing it as it comes up, like through 
application of common sense rules, common sense classroom behavior expectations that are enforced, the setting of clear boundaries that are age appropriate and then enforcing those and counseling the kids who need extra or sending them to a counselor who is a licensed clinician for extra counseling. So instead of addressing it as it comes up and keeping the classroom focused on academic learning presented in an you know age appropriate way that has already taken into account where they likely are in their social emotional development all right they're trying to like just teach social emotional learning like this is what you need to think and this is how you need to be and behave and who you need to be friends with and how you need to talk to other people and so forth and it's direct instruction of it which I haven't seen data that it works. I've actually seen some signs that it is counterproductive. And because they're now explicitly doing it for the purpose of achieving social justice and racial justice, a lot of us, myself included, are suspicious. That's actually putting it mildly about it. And we think they're using it to sort of reprogram the kids away from the values they learn at home and towards a collectivist mindset that they as an individual come second and how they treat other people of a certain variety, you know, like who fit certain criteria comes first. So it's no longer about helping the individual access the learning more effectively and more about teaching them how to be so activists and how to, you know, only interact with the learning insofar as it was appropriate for their particular set of identities. Okay. So, but that doesn't change the fact that the kids are not learning how to get along with others because they're at home and in a virtual school. And then you might say, well, isn't this what people worry about with homeschoolers? Again, when you're aware, as you set out to de de design your child's education, soup to nuts, that you're going to need to have a way for them to interact with other people, you plan for that. You, that's why we call it blended learning. You have things that happen in the field, you know, outside in the world and activities you go to and clubs you go to and little sports you sign up for and so forth and so on, co-ops, to make sure they have in-person encounters. In fact, homeschool kids over the last two years did not have the same deficit, either in their academic learning or in their social emotional learning, because we plan for that. So because what about socialization? I'm like, yes, that will become your responsibility to make sure that you personally are socializing your child and that you're make, giving them opportunities to socialize with other kids. That doesn't necessarily have to happen within an institution. But if you're relying on the institution to do it for you, I can tell you virtual school is not getting the job done. So you're not homeschooling because you're not getting the benefit of what homeschoolers do. And you're not even getting the benefit of what you would have gotten in the institution if they're in a building with other humans. You're not getting that either. All right. The content, it's poor. We know that it's poor because, again, the subject matter expertise is not there in the building. So they're not going to do a very good job of translating it to an environment they're not very good at. And this, I know a lot of parents have complained to me about. So this should not come as a surprise. Online courses are designed to have a heavier student workload. There's more the student has to do necessarily because you can't sit in the online environment and do work with each other, right? You, you can't like, you know, like we're all going to sit here with our cameras on and we're going to silently write and do things. Whereas when you're in the classroom, the child can work independently or in a group. If it's some, something that lends itself well to a group on some kind of work and the teacher can move around the classroom while they do it. So the teacher can, you know, they can take attendance and know the kid is there doing work but you're not just sitting in front of a camera doing it, which makes kids feel all kinds of weird. A lot of times they turn off the camera if they, and you can't make them turn the camera on. That's the other thing. A teacher cannot say to the kid, turn on your camera and make it happen. So a kid doesn't want to be on camera, doesn't want to participate. They're not going to, and there's nothing you can do about it except suddenly mark them off or something. And they might have 17 reasons they don't want you to see them. Maybe they're embarrassed because their house is messy and they have to sit in the middle of the living room and they don't want their peers to see where they live. Maybe their mom or dad is not, you know, is walking around behind them and they don't want you to see that. Maybe they are just embarrassed to be on camera. It's, same kid can feel fine in the classroom and be embarrassed to be on camera. There's so many reasons kids, especially younger kids, might not want to do that. Um, poorly organized, et cetera. Okay. So this is what, you know, a home homeschooler has put together to explain it and that just gives you some ideas. All right. I've touched on the idea of inequity, which I find ironic because 
like I said, where have we spent so much money in the last couple of years talking about equity, diversity, equity, inclusion, making sure kids have access. We've all seen the graphic with the little boxes that the kids have to stand on to watch the baseball game. So it is absolutely contradictory and hypocritical for these same people to suddenly say, we need to, especially the teachers unions, we need to go back to virtual learning for their protection, our protection, everybody's protection. It's objectively inequitable. Not every kid is going to have all of these things at home, least of all on a dime. They're not going to have it. And it's not like, like I said, the schools are saying, here's X thousands of dollars. Go, we're shifting the cost. We're giving you the cost that we've shifted back to you, or we're giving you the money to pay for the shifted costs. They're not doing that. And the salaries of the teachers aren't going down, even though they're probably spending less time in front of your kid, especially in K through five. And yet you're losing money if you have to stay home and you can't go to work. You're losing your sanity because you have to supervise. You don't get paid to monitor their motivation. You don't get paid to monitor whether they're doing their class work. You're actually paying now on top of your taxes. So it, it that hurts. Who does that hurt the most? That hurts the traditionally marginalized community, does it not? It also hurts the English language learning community. What if they ha were able to go to, you know, second, like ESL classes, whatever, what's happening now? What if the, the parents don't speak English and they're counting on the people who speak Spanish and English within the school to help their kid, but now they have to help their kid and they can't even read half the assignments. So this hurts the very people more they claim to want to help the most. And why is this especially egregious two years in? Because we know more now. You could have, if you're going to be generous, understood at the very beginning, you know, April of 2020, you could have understood that they said, we're, we're scared. We don't know what's, we don't know. We don't know. We don't know about this thing, but we do know now. And we have vaccines, right? which you can take. Now, I mean, they're being mandated all over the place. Again, New York, they're being mandated. And in the tri-state area, I just saw news yesterday, they are still considering going to remote learning, to virtual learning because of Omicron. This is even when they are mandating vaccines and masks and 95s, they're still using it as a justification when we know the risk, the real measurable risk to these children and to these adults is infinitesimally small, like nearly statistical zero relative to, I'm not gonna say it's zero. So please don't come at me with, oh my God, but the guys knew the kid who died. Okay. Doubt it was Omicron, but okay. 10 worldwide total, but okay. But relative to the risk of learning loss, relative to the risk of mental health negative outcomes, relative to the risk of abuse, Right? They're talking about abuse all the time, right? Okay. You stress people out. You cut their income. You do all these kinds of things. If you're worried about abuse, which they seem to be very worried about and tell people you can't homeschool your kids because of abuse, but we're suddenly not worried about it when we don't want to go to work. So it's automatically inequitable. Okay. And now let's talk about what you could do better. All right. So I've just, I've given you all the, uh, right. A lot of it's probably common sense that you knew before and you just are like nodding along. I'm guessing uh, maybe some of you didn't think about, but there it is. What could you do? Even if you've got to stay in the school and you've got this virtual learning situation. Okay. Now I'm going to say some things that are controversial. I, I don't want to be misinterpreted as saying do this. Okay. I'm saying these are options. Only you can know if this will work for you within your district, with your teachers, et cetera, and so forth. These are just ideas, okay? So first idea is you could ignore it. What I mean by that is if you're already having to stay home because your child is not physically going to be in the school building, and so somebody is staying home with the child, there is a warm adult body there in the building, okay? You would do better for your child's learning to investigate some online learning options that are better tailored to your child's specific learning style and personality and so forth to learn the same material so they don't have learning loss, but ignore what is coming from the school. If your child is struggling with what's coming from the school, if you look at it and you can't make heads or tails of it, or if you just plain think it's work overload, busy work, it's dumb, I would suggest to you, you consider ignoring it. 
you would write a note to the teacher saying, my child does not learn well in this environment. We are going to learn this material. I want to make sure I'm not missing anything. So by what I can see, it looks like he's supposed to be working on fractions or division or spelling, or whatever. But we're going to do it a little differently. Love to have your feedback if you have some suggestions, but we're going to take care of that. And I don't want my student marked off for not turning in this work. We're not going to turn in this work because this work is not uh, not conducive to our lives and we didn't choose this. So you draw you draw a line that you won't cross and you might get pushed, but well, well they're going to be marked off and me, 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 me. Well, I hope you all make a mental note of that, that they're not even remotely interested in working with you. Okay. But if you offer them an alternative, like I, my child will sit for a quiz, we'll take a little test, we'll write something up, we'll do some worksheets and scan them and send them to you so you see what we did do. But we're not going to sit in this online environment and do that because that is not working for my child. It is stressing them out. They don't learn well that way. We're doing something different. So that is one option that you could choose is for this sliver of time in your child's life, become a homeschooler. And if you want some help with that, I can help guide you through, for example, and give you some resources through my locals community. Um, we can talk about that, but that is an option. Another option for you is to take whatever absences you can and have your own sick out. So if they're saying they're going to do it for a week or X number of days or whatever, see how many absences you can have and take them and just be absent. Now you're going to say, well, Deb, what about the learning loss? Mm, make note of what they're covering because that is a possibility. But I still think if your child's mental health is at stake, that you do better by them to just let them know, like, I'm giving you the option and pick something that's not like, you know, don't just get to sleep all day, but pick something that is a worthwhile activity in your opinion, reading a book, playing certain games that you think are worthwhile, watching documentaries, you know, any number of possible learning activities they could do for that period of time instead of paying any attention to what is going on in the virtual environment. That is another option. And again, you might think, what, what about learning loss? You probably will have to make up some content, but you don't have to do it that day right then at that moment. Like let's say you can't adjust your schedule on the fly, but you can on Saturday. Do it on Saturday. Do it on Sunday. Do it in the evening when you get home. And the, you know, if you have a babysitter or grandparent or something like that, figure out a plan, tap into some resources like me and other homeschoolers and say, all right, so they say my kid has to know fractions by the end of this week, but this online thing is, for, you know, fakakta. I can't do it. Okay. Tap into the resources and we'll, other people will help you figure out a way to do that for your kid and give a kid a break. I'm serious. You, just because they say this is what we're doing doesn't mean you have to follow suit. There are workarounds. Come take the absences. And you say, oh, I'm going to use up all the absences. So figure out what does an unexcused absence mean? Now for K through five, it's less significant than it is for the upper grades, but virtual learning is less onerous for the upper grades too. And finding workarounds with online learning is a little bit easier. For a kid in K through five though, honestly, my personal opinion is put their mental health first. Put their mental health first and just being told you got to stay home when you were in school and now you can be home and you go to it. Like that is already stressful for them. Sit down with your child and talk to them about what they would like to do and not, not like giving them the choice, like, you know, what in the world do you want to do? But I mean, just say, all right, this is what the school's saying. How do you feel about that? And listen, really listen to what they say. And if they say, I'm fine with it, mom, it's okay. But you know, I need, do you need extra help? Do you want me to sit with you? Do you want me to watch over your shoulder? Do you want me to help you with some other way? Like have a conversation with the kid. Even a third grader can have that conversation. I think K through third, just don't flipping do it. The, the prospect of a kindergartner sitting in front of the computer, even homeschoolers don't do that. Okay. We just don't do that. We don't use hours of online education like that. Or if we do, um, it is with a specific program, which brings me to my last recommendation. And that is sign yourself up for a month of something called time for learning time. The number four learning time for learning.com. If you have a computer and you're already, you know, going to do that, the content is superior, the interactive lessons are superior. Your kid will have more fun with it. It is absolutely tied to state standards. You just put in what state you're in and whatever you're going to get is tied to their standards. You go by grade 
And you can even go by topic. So if it's like 30 bucks a month, I think, and you get all the subjects, you get whatever you need for that grade. Okay. So if you did for one month, $30, you go in there, you sign your child up, you say, we're not doing the district's thing. Just, no, it's don't, not going to work. It doesn't work for my kid. You put them in front of time for learning, which is more interactive and fun and colorful. And like, they've been doing this for more than 20 years. And it's like, they're experts at this whole thing. And you find what was the thing that the syllabus said you guys were working on? Okay, you're at like fractions. First of all, guess what? You can go backwards a bit if your kid is having trouble and start where they actually are. You can even ask the teacher if you have a good teacher, like, where is my child really? Like, please be honest with me. Are they are they up to snuff on this or do I need to go back two or three lessons? And you can do that because kids catch up like that. And you can spend some extra time because they won't need as much time at home as they do at school. And ha have them do the lessons before the lesson so they really understand it. Then do the lesson where they are and let them keep on going. Let them keep going. That's the other beauty of it is if they're having fun and they're like cruising along, they could surpass the class. And then when they go back to school, instead of having learning loss, they'll be ahead. Now, not much you can do to replace the they're in school and they're seeing their friends, but they won't be wearing a mask. Okay. They won't be sitting on the cold, hard ground outside eating lunch or whatever else is they're doing in these kinds of places, whatever they're, they're doing, they won't be doing, they'll at least be learning the content and you won't have to personally do it. So if you don't want to just give them a break, okay, which like I said, K through three, I just read to them or let them read, play, do puzzles, do board games, you know, that kind of stuff. But if you really are concerned and like, eh, they have it K through 12 time for learning sign up. I don't get any money for this. I'm not a spokesperson. I'm not an affiliate, nothing. No one's paying me for advertising. Um, I just am a person who's used it. That was as a homeschooler, my sick day because parents get sick. Parents, you know, parents have neither day off or whatever. Uh, there were plenty of things, especially because I was, you know, pregnant and nursing and pregnant. Okay. I would put my other children in front of time for learning on those days when I didn't want them to have nothing, but I just couldn't deal. Because I knew they'd keep up and I'd say, all right, start here and just keep going because they don't care. Do you start in the middle? There's nobody on the other end who's going to say, no, 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 you can't do that. They will give you access to the whole grade, but then it's listed by item, like what the thing is that you want to learn. So you can go in on a lesson and start wherever you are. And they give you access to one grade behind and one grade ahead. So if it's too easy, you can keep going. If it's a little too hard, you can go back at your leisure. Kids love this and they get immediate uh, gratification as far as like, how am I doing? How am I doing? How am I doing? Because there are quizzes, they pass the quizzes, they get a little banner, like you did it, move on to the next thing. There are kids who absolutely love this and it's 30 bucks for one month. So if you're going to be doing virtual learning for a month, it might be worth your while just to do that. And then when they go back to school, send it back. Okay. And if they're doing this, it buys you a little time if you need to work from home or do something else. Okay. And there's nobody on a camera on the other side looking into the home. Kids also like that. So that's my other suggestion. Now, I'm going to scan this chat before we finish up to see if there are some questions um, that uh, you guys have that I should be addressing. So I'm going to go all the way back to the beginning real quick. Um, let's see. Yeah. It's amazing that they're trying to blame capitalism for the opposition because <laughs> they don't want competition from the schools getting good at virtual learning. I promise you that's not it. Um, and then this person says, um, hell, if they're going to teach online, they might as well give every kid an Oculus and do real virtual learning. That's, that's funny. Um, kids do need human contact. So even we homeschoolers know that. Um, Let's see. We could build networks of worker-owned co-ops in all fields. Yes. Yes, we can. So now you're thinking outside the box. Those are the kind of things that currently homeschoolers, blended learners, we're, we've been doing for two years. We've been thinking of these ideas. Um, in-person teaching. Rhonda says in-person teaching has more control over what is going on with the student and less time with parents looking over the teacher's shoulders. Hmm. True. Um. They, it, there's there's pros and cons. So I'm not sure what you were, what you meant, but there is more control over what's going on with the student and less time with parents looking over their shoulders. So that's that's good if you're a good teacher, but it's also something desirable for bad teachers. And yet a lot of the bad teachers want would prefer sort of in their hierarchy of needs are like, well, 
I'd rather not have to go into work, even if it means mom and dad are looking over my shoulder. Now, remember, in the last two years, they have learned that we're looking over their shoulders. And they are modifying the language, the English language itself, to hide what they're doing. They're either putting it inside the assignments that are in the Google Classroom or in the, you know, the Canvas or the Schoolology or whatever. So what they hear, what we hear them saying and what is on the paper that the kid has to fill out are totally different things. I've seen examples of that recently. Parents have sent me like I listened in on the class and it sounded perfectly normal. But then I looked at what my kid was turning in and I was like, Bleh. what is that? Right. So they're getting clever about what they're doing. Um, <laughs> happy to hear someone use the word innumeracy. I have a book book titled that by John Allen Pellos, 1988. Yes. Innumeracy. It's, it's underused. Um, basically we have an entire nation that is innumerate. Otherwise they wouldn't get away with throwing these statistics at us and throwing, you know, all kinds of math info at us in headlines and having people go, but did you see that it said, th yeah. okay. All right. Um, let's see. We need to wear flotation devices when it rains. Yeah. This, the safetyism is killing our kids. All right. Um, let's see. Keep going. Um, there's more about safetyism. Very true. What is this? It says, Oh God, it's like fifth year at Hogwarts with umbrage teaching Dada. No practical applications because why would you ever need to know that dearies theory should be enough. Yeah. Um, they're doing that with science. They're doing it with math. Anything that is very difficult to teach. Actually, math is less difficult to teach online than, than science, but it's still, if you, if you're little kids and you need to use, you know, some kind of manipulatives, things like this, right. Um, which are helpful, unifix cubes, all that kind of stuff for the very young kids that We'll just teach them the theory. What do you guess the answer would be? What do you think a good answer would be? What's like, how might you find the answer? And it's, don't you think they're going to need to actually know the answer? So taking notes is important. Yes, this is something that, by the way, is better to do by hand, as is writing, especially for little kids. And it's not, you know, not happening enough. Oh yeah. Who remembers dry cell batteries? Remember we had to make those and we had to do the, we had to do electrical currents and stuff. Hard to do online. Even we homeschoolers are looking for new ways to do that. Uh, same with microscopes. Um, hi, sour kiwi. Let's see. Continuing through. Um, yep. Bad handwriting is a problem. They're definitely not learning cursive anyway. Um, let's see. This says, I think online computer learning, whatever you want to call it, should be a bit like a game with levels and scoring and rewards. Get the game industry involved. They already are. And this is what I mentioned, a time for learning. You're going to see a fair amount of that gamification in some of the lessons. It's why the kids tend to like it better. Also, Khan Academy is like that. Khan Academy is free. That's something else you can try to use. I think it works better for middle school and above because there's a fair amount of reading. And it, you do have to be quite a bit more self-motivated. There's not as much fun character stuff and games for littler kids. Um, although the time for learning stuff does adapt as they get older to be a little more mature, you know, not as cutesy pie. But Khan Academy does do this. You get badges, you get rewards, you get levels. It's it, They have done that. And it's free, which is great. Um, and... Yep. Narrow laptop keyboards that we're worried about now with repetitive motion problems for our kids, not just for us. Um, eye strain for our kids. Many of you may have read that you don't, you just don't retain the information that you read online as well as you do in a paper book. That is true. Um, same by the way for audiobooks And I mentioned before how some of these solutions are inequitable. When you have a child with special needs, even if they're low level, I mean, the, 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 the high needs kids suffer the most obviously with virtual learning, but there are plenty of kids out there with ADD or just like mild dyslexia, or they are just, they have auditory processing challenges where it's just more difficult for them to retain what they hear versus what they see or what they do. Okay. Now I've made the mistake recently and I, Mia culpa, I shared a triangle um, on Twitter. And I want to show it to you because I, I do want to make sure that I am not misconstrued as, as, you know, misunderstanding this triangle. But there was a guy by the name of Edgar Dale. Edgar Dale created the cone of experience. And the he, he was a researcher, educator um, for, you know, many, many years. And 
he came up with this cone of experience of like the different ways that we interact with the world and learn from our experiences. And unfortunately, as with many things like, you know, the learning styles thing, this has been abused over time and people have applied statistics like percentages to it that show like you, ret you retain this much from hearing and this much from doing and this much of thing. Most of those numbers can't really be backed up by the data. And um, it's uh, it's a it's a problem because it makes people think they should never do online learning or they should never do any kind of virtual classroom experiences because, oh gosh, I looked at the cone of experience and it said that, you know, it's all bad. It's not. It's been abused. So the the while while we do retain the written word better when we read it on paper, that's not to say that reading online is completely worthless or that listening to audiobooks is worthless. It's just you need to be mindful of that when you're doing it and you're choosing that method so you can supplement or, or understand the child's, you know, uh, proclivities. I won't say learning style. We all have use all learning styles. It's just we like some better than others. And why would you want to go out of your way to force your child to learn in a way they don't like that doesn't it's just difficult for them because they don't find it interesting. Boredom is a big thing, right? Especially when you're learning new skills that are hard. Um, so, you know, in terms of how we learn, online learning in and of itself is not bad or, um, uh, it, you know, it's not an automatic negative. You just have to understand how it works well and how it doesn't work well. And that's what they're not doing in the, in the school. So if you see in my Twitter feed, like, but Deb, didn't you say that, you know, the cone of experience, the cone of learning, it's been misstated as the cone of learning that they should, you know, only do things in person. What? No, that's not true either. And like I said, many of us do blended learning and especially for kids sixth grade and up, um, that there are many ways to do it very well. So I don't want to diss on e-learning completely. There are some great companies doing great things. Well, we're just about up at the hour. So I hope that this has been useful for you. Um, but I, I, I do want parents to understand that this is not just a ho-hum, we're going back to virtual learning. This should be a, considered an emergency, in my opinion, for you, if you're in this position, you should fight it tooth and nail. If you can't fight it, you know, and get your lawmakers to prevent this from happening or, you know, fight back against your unions and prevent it from happening, then I say fight it in your own home. Don't do it. Don't participate in it. Find a workaround for your child. And if they try to hold it against you or I'm going to fail the kid, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. Feel free to use some of these arguments. My that does surprise me considering the CDC has said dot, dot, dot. That is surprising to me considering how inequitable it is. I thought y'all were pursuing equity. Well, you're going to fail my child because this is not working for them and it didn't work for them for all the many months that you made us do it last time. Demonstrably didn't work for my child. So I'm going to take matters into my own hands and I'm asking you for assistance to do something else or I'm using time for learning and I will be happy to send you the printout of their quizzes to get credit for covering this material that is standard aligned to the state standards. I'm going to do my part. Are you right? So fight it. Don't just passively accept that this is this thing you have to deal with because you, you shouldn't deal with it. They can't make you any more than they can make your kid turn the camera on. So anyhow, that's, and then, like I said, if you, if this causes you to think that I can't take this, this up and down and back and forth, and what if they decide that they want to dub themselves experts at virtual learning, and this is what school's going to be from now on. There's been talk about that. There has been discussion in union circles that they would like to take all the learning to a virtual situation. Okay. So maybe you want to get out ahead of that and become a blended learner for your family or take advantage of this time to reevaluate your family structure and figure out how you're going to homeschool. And I put that in quotes, like I said, because it doesn't have to happen inside your home. You can find a, a co-op or build community resources or find the community resources that are out there already doing this. And where there's a will, there's a way. You can do it. So 
Thank you all for coming today. Please slam that like button if you haven't already. Consider subscribing to the channel and hitting the notification bell to be notified when I make new videos if YouTube will notify you. I'm hearing they're not doing that so much with my channel, unfortunately. Uh, share this. But you can comment after this is over. The live, you won't be able to comment live, but the, uh, the feed will be up as a recording and you can continue to share it out. If you're interested in my locals community, it's at thereasonwelearn.locals.com. And I do have one Zoom call a week for my supporting members where we can talk about these things in much more depth. So if you're going through this and you're like, I would like some help, please, like one-on-one, -on -one, consider becoming a supporter and you know coming to one of those meetings because you might benefit from that. So thanks everybody. Have a great afternoon and I will see you next time.